All right, so we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna laugh. This is great. I'm so excited to be here. I met some new friends today out in the lobby area or sitting down with some really cool. Actually, I didn't meet them. I just waved at them and stuff. So today, I feel like I should tell you before I get started, um, because I'll pray right beforehand and I'll be like, hey, God, is there anything specific you want to say to the people? And it is, and he wants you to know that he loves you. Listen, I'm not saying that like some broad, the Lord loves you. No, 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 specifically, he wanted me to tell you. I didn't say this to the first service. I'm not saying he don't love him. I'm just telling you <laughs> he loves you. Like, for real, I didn't say that to them. It was the first service. Uh, anyway, so uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of the verses that I want you to write down. And then later, I want you to read it because I think it'll pop in a new way. There's three verses total that'll be this way. If you read these when you get to the crib, it's going to be like, yo, might be too much slang for a few people. Uh, you shall delight in those verses once you arrive at your residence. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11, John 10, 27, and Revelations 3, 20. Cool. Hey, dude, you guys can probably put it on the screen. And we don't need my logo up here just in general for like, Weekend services, nah, you throw a picture of a cross or something up there. Like, we don't need my logo. <laughs> this, is, I just, this is the first time I'm going to look back, but you don't got to change it now because it'll be a distraction, but just <laughs> the next one we'll have it down because that's a little. Like, there's a cross, then there's my logo. I don't want that. Like, it's just a little. All right, let's get started. So today I'm going to talk to you about my church experience. I see some, there's a few kids here who look like they're happy to be here. What's your name, pretty lady, with the glasses on? What's your name? Oh, she said Zoe, which means the God kind of life. That is awesome. When I was your age, I used to go to church like this, and it was miserable. You understand? Church was miserable. No, 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 no. You don't understand? It was miserable. It lasts seven hours, and my grandmother would just take me to this church, and it, my shoes were like three sizes too small. And my grandmother had this thing called a shoehorn. So if your foot don't fit, now it do. And church lasts, like I said, six, seven hours. Then we go in the basement and eat a sandwich and come back up. I'm like, what was that, halftime or something? <laughs> and my clothes were too tight. Every Sunday, I wore a white and brown shirt every single Sunday. It was actually just white, but the buttons were so tight. <laughs> it was miserable. I walk into this church. This is my church experience from a seven-year-old. This is a seven-year-old. I walk into church, and this dude is up on stage, and he is mad at everybody. And I tried to figure out why he was mad, and I figured it out. He was mad because he had some phlegm caught in his throat. Because at the end of every sentence, he would try to get it out. He was like, the Lord said, ah. <laughs> Act like you're, ah. <laughs> Some of my white friends are like, I don't understand what you're referring to. <laughs> it, was, it was miserable, and the church had, the name of it always had more than five syllables. I'm going to leave it at that. It was just really, really uncomfortable. Seven years old. One time we go to church, there's a dead body in front. Nobody explains to a seven-year-old Michael Jr., this is a funeral. It's not church. I'm thinking, yo, that's how they roll. Like every few weeks or so, they bring a dead body in as an example or something. <laughs> and the dude on stage would yell at us like, we did this or something. I didn't understand what was going on, so I asked my grandma. I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? <laughs> the dude on stage got on stage, here, and he would explain what happened, and all I caught from him was, he went to see the king. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. The whole explanation why the dude is in the box is he went to see the king. <laughs> and I was in the kids' choir. Not because I could sing, I just happened to be a kid. And what song we got to sing? Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. <laughs> I don't want to see the king. That's what happened to the man in the box. <laughs> it was miserable. It was so miserable. My, my feet was balled up the whole time, crying. My grandma's like, you want to pray for your feet? I want to take these shoes off, grandma. It was miserable. 14 years old. Instead of forcing me to go to church, my grandmother did something different. She asked, me, she asked me if I wanted to go. I was like, let me think this over, Grandma. No. <laughs> so I wouldn't go to church no more. I didn't have to go anymore. It was awesome. I just hung out with my friends. And we were broke growing up. We ain't had no money. I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. <laughs> I 
<laughs> That's a funny joke, man. Some Christians don't know what to do with that joke. You can't laugh and shake your head. <laughs> it was just, like, we just didn't go. And we, we would do stuff. We would play games. Like, remember the game Slug Bug? If you're from the East Coast, they call it Punch Bug. Here's how the game works. You see a Volkswagen bug, you get to hit your friend. Those are all the instructions. In my neighborhood, they would take this game a little too far. They would add to the game. You ever play Uppercut Fire Truck? <laughs> what about Minivan Body Slam? You ever play that game? There was always one crazy dude in the group who would make up games on the spot, like hit you in the throat, tall building. You play too much. So it was just, we, just, we just didn't play those games. We, had, we added to the games. In fact, me and my friend made a deal at around 14 years old that we wouldn't curse anymore. This was a deal. If he heard me, let's be real. You don't know Jesus. As soon as you leave the house, you want to feel like a man. That's what you do. You start cursing. But me and my friend made a deal that we wouldn't do that anymore. In fact, if he heard me curse, this was a deal. He could hit me in the chest as hard as he wanted to and vice versa. Duke could hit really hard. I stopped cursing immediately. I also noticed around this age, I was struggling with my reading. Now, I think I noticed it before, but I didn't care. But now I'm noticing girls, and I don't want them to know I'm struggling with my reading. So my brain would start to scramble to figure out what words were. I would look at the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it. I did all of these things just to figure out what a word was. And then it got to the point where I got really, really good at this. To the point in high school, I wasn't really reading. I was just working it out really, really fast because I had seven different ways to approach words. Now as an adult, I read just fine, but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place that I pull my comedy from. So that very thing from my past that looked like it was a handicap, it seemed as if I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he asked me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing, even though I didn't know I was practicing. Let me say this again so you can hear what I'm saying. That thing from your past, the fact that you never met your dad before, your parents were divorced, you were raped. God did not cause that, but he'll use it in preparation for what he has for you to do. Chances are you've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here to let you know you've been practicing, and for a lot of you guys, it is game time but you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. So now, as a result of my practice, I find funny everywhere. I just do. Funny just shows up. People ask weird questions. Michael Jr., where are you from originally? Originally? Huh. Well, I was conceived in Michigan. Uh, before that, I was with my dad. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then there's a swim competition, right? Uh, and I won, which is crazy, right? <laughs> Currently, I don't swim at all, man, but I used to be fast, man. I was fast back in the day. <sighs> you got to explain that to Zoe later on, okay? You, you explain that to her. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, I don't want to know. So one of the things that I didn't like at all, I should say about, I shouldn't say I didn't like it. How do I, how do I set this up? Church was extremely uncomfortable for me. Very, very, very uncomfortable, so I just wouldn't go. 26 years old, I moved to New York City. I hope you're tracking when we went from seven to 14 to 26. I moved to New York City from Michigan. Why did I move to New York City? Because now I'm doing comedy, and I want to know for sure if I'm funny. And in New York, if you're not funny, the way they let you know is they'll say something like, you're not funny. So there's this comedy club in New York called The Comic Strip Live. It's one of the hardest clubs to get into. This club is so prestigious, they used to have an open mic on Tuesday nights that would be at 7 p.m. And comedians who were new in town, like myself, would start lining up at like 6 o'clock in the morning so they can do three minutes in front of the manager in hopes that he'll call them back the next month and they don't have to wait in line. Very hard to get into this club. It's finally my turn to perform at The Comic Strip Live, and right before I get on stage, a comedian named George Wallace walks in. Now, George Wallace is a very established comedian, which means whenever someone like that walks in, whoever's next gets bumped. At best, they have to wait if they go on at all. I'm next. I know I'm about to get bumped. I know it. The manager's already walking over towards me. I'm about to get bumped. I know it's about to happen. But no, this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. There's a difference. So the manager says to me, hey, Michael, listen, George Wallace is here. Would you like to go on before him or after him? That never happens. 
Never happens. I was like, before him, please. So I'm going before George Wallace. I get on stage, and I got New Yorkers laughing. But then he comes in, and he's laughing as well. Then after the show, there's a bunch of comedians that are all around him, asking him questions. He leaves them, and he walks over to me. And he says, uh, you're really funny. I was like, oh, wow, snap. Thanks, man. He said, let me ask you a question. He's like, why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know. What if my grandmother walk in or something? <laughs> my grandmother wasn't coming to New York, but what else was I going to say? My friend might hit me in the chest. I'm a grown man. <laughs> so he said, you're funny and you're clean. I'd like for you to do a show with me and my best friend in a couple nights. I didn't know who his best friend was. It didn't matter. I'm pumped. It's another show. I, I need as much stage time as I can get. I get to the show, it's me, George Wallace, his best friend is Jerry Seinfeld. We do two shows, I got two standing ovations. I rip, I'm the man, I'm like, yes. After the show, the club manager walks up to me, it's a different club, he said, Michael, you had a great set. He said, let me ask you a question. Would you like to go to church with me tomorrow? I just got two standing ovations. Why are you messing this up right now, man? <laughs> and my first thought was, man, back up. You're making my feet hurt. I don't want to go to church. <laughs> now, I'm going to pause in the story for a moment to explain to you this statement, you're making my feet hurt. Because I, that was a thought that I had in that moment, but I wasn't able to articulate the thought until later on. The reason my feet was hurting when he asked me to go to church if you guys recall, when I was a child, I would go to church, and my shoes were always two to three sizes too small. And I'm sitting in church for seven hours. So what I actually developed was what is called a negative neural association attached to the pain that I had when I was at church. So when I became an adult, whenever someone would approach me about the Bible or God or anything else, I would have that pain in my feet. Meaning, not necessarily a physical pain always, but for sure a, a significant discomfort that I couldn't articulate at the time. And it was holding me back. So whenever someone would approach, approach me, any time after that about God or they had a Bible or anything, I would be like, ah, back up. I won't have anything to do with it. Because of that negative neural association, it actually kept me from having a relationship with Jesus. You have some negative neural associations. There's some things in you that you don't like to do, some people you don't like to be around, some buttons that get pushed that is keeping you from God's best in your life. And as we talked about last night, if you were at the marriage event, we talked about how you need to press in to find out what those things are, because most of the time, people push out. I was pushing out. Somebody walked up to me, I'm like, back up, weird Christian. Get out of here. No, leave me alone. Those people, that. I was pushing out. God showed me a process where when I press in, there's freedom. If the solution to your problem has an external character, you are not in control. If the solution to your problem has an external character, you are not in control. My problem was Christians get away from me. I don't like you. Get away. Who's in control? Creepy Christians. Not me. Sometimes instead of pressing in, what people will do is they'll push out, like I said. Or instead of pressing in to find out what that thing is in you, because there's something in you that God wants you free from. And he's bringing other people that you don't like around to show it to you. Life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free yet. Life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free yet. There's an area where you're not free. I wasn't free. I didn't know anything about Jesus, and I didn't want to because them people was creepy. Now, I'm not saying there's not any creepy Christians out there because there is. In fact, if you don't know any creepy Christians, it's you. I'm going to throw that out there right now. Like... <laughs> You the one. So I'm barely touching on this process right now, but there is a way that you can press in and get free. Some of the people were here last night. You probably got the course. We have a course that can walk you through this whole thing. It's a marriage course, but it works for everybody. If you want to get that course, you can do that. I also wrote a cool book. There's a bunch of really cool stuff you can get after the service. I think I'll be signing stuff. But because there's so much stuff going on in the world, anything that you buy at our merchandise table, the proceeds are actually going to to, uh, to a black family in America. So I just want to say that. <laughs> that laugh is awesome. What was that? <laughs> Sound like somebody stabbed a gerbil in the middle, like, hey, hey, hey. This is a beautiful laugh. Back to the story. Where was I? Who was paying attention? 
You just said, me? You didn't even give me the story. She said, who was paying attention? Me? Where was I? I don't know. Yes, so I get invited to, so they invite me to this church. Wait, y'all just threw me off. What'd you say? Proceeds going to a black family. Before that, <laughs> you, you, you got lost in your lab. You was like, hee hee. So George Wallace invites me to this, to this show. I think that's where I was at. Stop it, people. You're confusing me right now. There's too much going on. I'm going to go with this lady right here. She took notes. This happens sometimes. Where, where, did, I, where did I leave off in the story at? Boom. Thank you. Wow. If you need something done, find somebody with a notepad. Y'all all in y'all brain. Ah. He gets ties and offerings. Anyway. So, yes, he invites me. The manager invites me to church. He said, would you like to go to church? I was like, yo, man, I, I'm going to church. Back up. My feet, I don't, this is very uncomfortable. No. 20 minutes later, his fiance asked me the same question, but she was fine. <laughs> she, there's two reasons. This is a sidetrack, too, so get me back if I need to. There's only two reasons you do anything in life. There's only two reasons. There is the reason you're here right now today, the reason you're getting in your car, there's only two reasons you do anything in life, to avoid pain or to gain pleasure. Think about anything you've ever done. It was for one of those two reasons. Why are you at church right now? Some of y'all here to avoid some pain because your mama been asking you to come. Some of you here because you know some phenomenal benefits. There's only those two reasons. So she asked me if I wanted to go to church and she was beautiful. She had some sort of accent. She's like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day, man. <laughs> find me a church. So I go to this church, and I can't even find these people, and, and I'm sitting way in the back, and this dude comes out on stage, and he's talking about Jesus, just like your pastor. He's just talking about Jesus. He's not screaming. He's not yelling. He don't got no perm. He's just talking about Jesus. <laughs> then he did a thing where he did an altar call, and he said, if you want Jesus in your life, all you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and Jesus is yours. And I wanted to do it. Yo, like, I, Black, I really wanted to, but I was like, nah, I got to read the pamphlet first. Because I don't know what all this stuff is about. I knew some Christians. It was kind of weird. Their voice changed when they talk about God. Can I tell you about the Lord? Like, ah, that stuff is creepy. <laughs> so I told myself I'd, I'd read the Bible before I gave my life to Jesus. And I didn't even have a Bible. And then some lady who I don't even know at a mall hands me a Bible and walks off like the Lone Ranger or somebody. We never exchanged words. <laughs> Just hand me a Bible. So I get the Bible, and I start reading it. First thing I read was the copyrights. The Bible was made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Me too? It's crazy. Never met before. <laughs> so I'm reading the Bible, going to church, reading the Bible. Got to the part about the job. I'm like, no wonder I don't want one of them. That's crazy, man. I keep reading. <laughs> it's comedy up here if you want it, people. <laughs> so I'm reading. I'm going to church. I got to the part in Matthew where it said Jesus died for me. I did not know that Jesus died for me. Till I was 27 years old. I didn't know. I've been to church before, screaming, yelling. Nobody was teaching in a way that I could understand it. I didn't know he died for me until I was 27. I read it in Matthew. Then I turned to Mark, and he died again. <laughs> then in Luke, I get to John. I'm like, why are you going in the garden, Jesus? You know what they're going to do. <laughs> Listen, I wish that was some comedy I wrote. I actually thought Jesus died four times. I got to Revelation. I finished reading the Bible, and I remember going to church and giving my life to Jesus, early, like, during the announcements. I know you didn't normally do it at the end, but I was like, yo, is he here right now? Because I don't know how this works. So I give my life to Jesus, and I recognize some stuff. I used to just think I was funny. Now I understand I'm funny for a reason. There's purpose behind me having a sense of humor. There's purpose behind the gifts and the talents you have. Even the setbacks have purpose. So now I get celebrities, some that you would know, who ask me questions about God. They say stuff like, explain God to me. Explain God? I can't explain God. Then they'll change their question. Okay, tell me this. How is it I can do all of these things that I'm doing? And you still say, people still say that God wants a relationship with me. And this is all I could come up with at the time. But, and this isn't even close to how awesome God is. But this is what I said. I said, God is like being, in a, it's like being in a car with a navigation device. You ever been in a car with a navigation device before? You ever been in a car before? We could start there. You guys ever been in a car? <laughs> It's like being in a car with a navigation device. If it says go 10 blocks and turn left, then you go 10 blocks and turn right. It doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. 
it recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. Only problem is if you keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions may be different. They may be rougher and you're running out of time. So you have to be sensitive to listen to that voice so you can make the right choice about where you're supposed to be. And that voice sounds an awful lot like a coach because you haven't been practicing for nothing. It's game time. So now, um, man, I'm at the point where I got one of two stories I can share. I'm not going to be able to do both stories. What's your name up front, super helpful lady? What's your name? Amy. Cool. Sounds like you really want to talk about yourself. <laughs> hey, me, let's stay focused. So Amy, I have a choice between one of two stories I can share right now. One is about the first time I went to prison. The other one is about the first time I did The Tonight Show on NBC. I'm going to let you choose. Prison, Tonight Show. Leave her alone. Stop trying to influence people. You don't take good notes. <laughs> Your son says prison. Cool. Way to be influenced by others. <laughs> All right. So I have a nonprofit called Funny for the Forgotten. Right? The other story, there's a bunch of stories in the book if you want to get a book. So I have a nonprofit called Funny for the Forgotten. And this... And what we do is we go to homeless shelters, prisons, abused children facilities. So I go, we're going to this prison. This is my first time ever doing comedy in prison. And I walk in, and the warden, they take my belt from me. It's like, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. <laughs> can't they just boo me like regular people? Like, why they got to hang me? <laughs> I'm in prison, my pants loose. Like, this is a bad idea, man. I don't need to... I got seven different ways to look at this, man. <laughs> so I'm walking in this prison, and I'm scared, and they gave me this little black box with a pin in it. And they said, if anyone tries to attack you, you just pull the pin out. And that's it. I'm like, what is this, a grenade? What are, like, what are we doing? This is the whole plan? And I feel, I'm not super, I'm not like afraid, afraid, because I got like eight guards around me as we walk into this prison. But slowly but surely, I'm not sure what happened, but they start peeling off one by one. I don't know if they just get hit by dark guns or... We get to the last set of bars, and it's just me and Barney Fife. <laughs> and this dude says to me, hey, this is as far as I go. I was like, well, me too, man. I ain't going in there. <laughs> but I know God is calling me to go in here. So I walk in, and I'm scared, like, for real. There's no stage. There's no glass. We're not doing comedy on the phone. <laughs> These dudes are right here expecting funny. And I walk in, and they're, they're all in this big circle, and there's a little hole in the middle of the circle with an aisle, and I'm assuming that's where I'm supposed to land and do comedy. So I'm walking, and I don't have any jokes popping up. I need a, I got like seven steps to go before when I land in the middle, if I don't have a joke, I don't know what's going to happen. I feel like I got 1.5 seconds from when I land to when I should start talking. Problem is, is as I'm walking, I got nothing popping up. Seven different ways to nothing. I had one joke pop up, but I didn't want to start with it. I was going to be like, you know what? You guys are a captive audience. I just want to say that. <laughs> no, nah, I didn't feel like I should start with that joke. So I got nothing. Seven different ways to nothing. Five steps, four steps left. Three, two, nothing, nothing, nothing. I picked this foot up and set it down. And for real, Black Rock, sitting right up front, is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. <laughs> when I said these words to Moses, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison ward, I want you to look him in his eye. You look him right in his eye, and I want you to say, let my people go. <laughs> For real. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? It wasn't as much pressure as you might think because I've been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was struggling with his reading. I was practicing just like you've been practicing. In some form or another, you've been practicing. Maybe through the pandemic, maybe from when you were a small child, you've been practicing, and it is game time. But you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. So me and my wife, we were looking at some old videos, some old home videos that uh, recently, it wasn't super old. It wasn't like a VHS. Um, some of the young people like Zoe's like, what's of a hush? <laughs> so we're looking at this old home video, and we came across this video of our youngest daughter being born. And I'm going to show you this clip. It's not her being born, because my wife, she don't want me showing you that clip. 
But let me set this up for you. I t the video you're about to watch, I took the video. But I didn't understand the power of the video until I watched the video. So my daughter at the time is like two and a half minutes old. She's two and a half minutes old, and they got her under that little, the little chicken warmer, the little french fry warmer thing. I don't know what kind of insurance we have, but they got her under a little, <laughs> the little heat lamp under. And she's two and a half minutes old, and the nurse is about to clean her up, and she starts to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. Okay, Portland, look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay, it's okay, I'm right here. Right here, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, baby. Yo, that was pretty dope, right? Now, it's like seven, maybe seven and a half minutes or so later, the nurse is done cleaning her up and she starts to cry again. I speak up and she stops crying again. But I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. Portland, it's okay. It's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. So here's the thing. There's going to be times in life where you feel like you've just been practicing and practicing and practicing. And maybe you're even frustrated and you're hurt, even to the point of tears. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice because he is talking to you. And what he wants you to know is that he's right here. He loves you. All you have to do is open your eyes. You hear some music? <laughs> yeah, not yet, man. You're too early, man. You're getting us all emotional. I'm not ready yet, man. Getting us all. I'm sitting here like, is that you, Lord? What is that? No, it's this dude right here. <laughs> wow. Wow, just hold on. I got one more story I need to tell, man. This brother's moved all smooth. We all teary and stuff, man. Calm yourself down, bro. So I want to tell a story about having a relationship with Jesus. Right, this is a story that, and the way I came up with this story is I was writing a joke. So first I'm gonna tell you how I came up with the story, then I'm gonna tell you the story, and at that point, this dude's supposed to slide in right there. <laughs> so the way I came up with this story is I was writing a joke. Uh, I was writing a joke about the good room. How many people in here know what the good room is? Raise your hand if you know what the good room is. See, there's like no hands going up. The truth is, just, just a few hands. Mostly all of you know what the good room is. Let me explain. The good room is that room in your grandmother's house, or maybe it's your house or maybe your aunt's house. It's that one room that's better than the rest of the house. Can't nobody go in there. It's plastic on the furniture. The china's located there. It's really just for looks. How many people know what the good room is now? Raise your hand. Exactly. So I'm writing this joke about the good room, and in the middle of writing this joke, God stops me and tells me to tell this story to his people instead. So I'm going to tell you the story. Now will be a great time to jump in if you want to. I don't mean to interrupt you while you... Yeah, it's just cool. Early and late. That is amazing. I don't know how he pulled that off. That's it's amazing. <laughs> so I want everyone in here, everybody. If you're on staff, you volunteer. I'm talking to everybody. This is a story about having a relationship with Jesus, and it may tweak your view a little bit. So I want you to imagine. Imagine that you are a house. Imagine that you're a house, and outside of the house, so it's like you're a house, but outside of the house is Jesus Christ, and he wants to come in, but he'll never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. Other people may have tried to force him into your house, but he'll never go in that way. He wants you to invite him in. And the reason some people in this room or watching right now, the reason you haven't invited Jesus into your house is because you're cool with the way things are right now. So it would seem. Whenever you need something, you just walk up to the door, crack it open, tell them what happened, say a little prayer, close the door and go back into the house. But that's not a relationship at all. 
How can you hear his voice under those circumstances? How can you utilize the practice under those circumstances? There may be some fear or there's something about something that someone has done that is keeping you from letting him in the house. But what that person did has nothing to do with you and him. Or some people won't let him in the house because your house is a mess. You think you need to clean it up first. How's that working out? There may be drugs or pornography in the house, alcohol, or relationships. You brought other people in the house, hoping that maybe somehow they could help you clean it up. Then you'll feel better, but they can't clean it up. The only one who can truly clean it up is standing outside the door wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand, waiting on you to truly open the door. Then there's other people in here right now used to have Jesus in the whole house, but whether you realize it or not, you've moved him to just one room in the house. The good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the one right up front with the big window? So when people look in, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. It's just that one room. So when they hear about you coming to church, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. It's just that one room. You quote scripture, but it's just that one room. You pray, but it's just that one room. You got a Bible app on your phone, but it's just that one room. Jesus wants access to the whole house, and I'm telling you, if you will open this door and let him in, he'll show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit, and they will make sure the house is functioning the way it was intended to. But none of this happens if you don't open the door, because he will not, he will never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. Thank you for watching Black Rock Church's Sunday service. We're so glad you found us, and we hope this message made you feel more connected to God. In talking about connection, we find that it's super important for people to be connected to others and to community in order to grow in their faith. So if you're in the area, we invite you to join us to worship in a service. You can find out about our times and locations right here on this webpage. We'd also love to help you connect in a group and find people who can walk alongside you as you continue deepening your understanding and faith. And after you get to know us, you might even like to use your gifts to serve on a team. We believe God gave each of us unique gifts that we can use to serve those around us, one body with many different parts. If you're not able to be here in person, don't worry. We have a great online community and many ways for you to join in virtually and talk to us throughout the week. You can also stay in touch on our website, YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram. By visiting our website, you can also easily give your offering one time as an online gift or a reoccurring gift. Just click Give at the top. The Bible tells us that tithing is an important part of our relationship with Jesus, and we want to continue to trust God with our lives and our finances. Well, we are so glad you made the choice to get to know us and view one of our services. We hope that you join us next week. Thanks so much for watching.